Welcome learners to this session on environmental chemistry. There will be a total of four sessions in this series. You have already studied about environment in your earlier classes. Environmental studies deal with the sum of all social, economical, biological, physical and chemical interrelations with our surroundings. In this sessions and in the next three sessions in this series of program, we will focus on environmental chemistry. Environmental chemistry deals with the study of origin, transport, reactions, effects and fates of chemical species in the environment. We will be dealing with the environmental pollution, strategies to control the pollution and green chemistry in the four sessions. So, let us first understand what is environmental pollution. The environmental pollution is the effect of undesirable changes in our surroundings that have harmful effects on plants, animals and human beings. A substance which causes pollution is known as a pollutant. The pollutants can be solid, liquid or gaseous substances present in greater concentration than in natural abundance and are produced due to human activities or due to natural happenings. Do you know an average human being requires nearly 12 to 15 times more air than the food. So, even a small amount of a pollutant present in air can become significant compared to similar levels present in the food. Pollutants can be degradable like discarded vegetables which rapidly break down by natural processes. Some pollutants which are slowly degradable remain in the environment in an unchanged form for many decades. For example, substances such as dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane which we normally call DDT and plastic materials, heavy metals, many chemicals, nuclear wastes etcetera once released into the atmosphere are difficult to remove. These pollutants cannot be degraded by natural processes and are harmful to the living organisms. In the process of environmental pollution, the pollutants originate from a source and get transported by air or water or are dumped into the soil by human beings. Let us now see what atmospheric pollution is. The atmosphere that surrounds the earth is not of the same thickness at all heights. There are concentric layers of air or regions and each layer has different density. The lowest region of the atmosphere in which the human beings along with the other organisms live is called troposphere. It extends to the height of approximately 10 kilometer from the sea level. Above the troposphere between 10 and 50 kilometers above the sea level lies the stratosphere. Troposphere is a turbulent dusty zone of air and it contains much water vapor and clouds also. This is the region of strong air movements and cloud formation. The stratosphere on the other hand contains dinitrogen, dioxygen, ozone and little water vapor. Atmospheric pollution is generally studied as tropospheric and stratospheric pollution. The presence of ozone in the stratosphere prevents about 99.5 percent of the sun's harmful ultraviolet radiations from reaching the earth's surface and thereby protecting the humans and other animals from its effects. In this session, we will be discussing about tropospheric pollution arising from gaseous air pollutants, while tropospheric pollution due to particulate matter will be dealt in the next session. The tropospheric pollution occurs due to the presence of undesirable solid or gaseous particles in the air. The major gaseous and particulate pollutants present in the troposphere are oxides of sulphur, nitrogen, 
and carbon, hydrogen sulphide, hydrocarbons, ozone and other oxidants and particulate pollutants are dust, mist, fumes, smoke, smog etcetera. Let us now study about the gaseous air pollutants in detail. In the gaseous air pollutants, the first category is that of oxides of sulphur. Oxides of sulphur are produced when sulphur containing fuel is burnt, especially the fossil fuel is burnt. The most common species which is sulphur dioxide is a gas and is poisonous to both animals and plants. It has been reported that even a low concentration of sulphur dioxide causes respiratory diseases such as asthma, bronchitis, emphysema in human beings. Sulphur dioxide causes irritation to the eyes resulting in tears and redness. High concentration of sulphur dioxide leads to stiffness in the flower buds which eventually fall off from the plants. The uncatalyzed oxidation of sulphur dioxide is slow. However, in the presence of particular matter in polluted air, the catalysis occurs and the oxidation of sulphur dioxide to sulphur trioxide occurs as is shown in the equation here. The reaction can also be promoted by ozone and hydrogen peroxide. You can see here that in first reaction sulphur trioxide is forming and in the second reaction sulfuric acid is resulting by the reaction of sulphur dioxide and hydrogen peroxide. The second category is oxides of nitrogen. Dinitrogen and dioxygen are the main constituents of air. These gases do not react with each other at the normal temperature, you know it. But at high altitudes, when lightning strikes, they combine to form the oxides of nitrogen. Nitrogen dioxide is oxidized to nitrate ion which is washed into the soil where it serves as a fertilizer. In an automobile engine at high temperature mind it, when fossil fuels are burnt, the dinitrogen and dioxygen combine to yield significant quantities of nitric oxide that is NO and nitrogen dioxide NO2. This is shown here in the reaction. The NO reacts instantly with oxygen to again give nitrogen dioxide. So, see NO2 is forming at a faster and faster rate. The rate of production of NO2 is faster when nitric oxide reacts with ozone in the stratosphere. Again you can see the reaction. The irritant red haze in the traffic and congested places is due to oxides of nitrogen only. The higher concentrations of nitrogen dioxide damage the leaves of the plants and retard the rate of photosynthesis. Nitrogen dioxide is a lung irritant that can lead to an acute respiratory disease in the children. It is toxic to living tissues also. Nitrogen dioxide is also harmful to various textile fibers and metals. The third category is that of hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are composed of hydrogen and carbon only and are formed by incomplete combustion of fuel used in the automobiles. Hydrocarbons are carcinogenic and they cause cancer. They harm plants by causing aging, breakdown of tissues and shedding of leaves, flowers and twigs. And the last category of gaseous pollutants is that of oxides of carbon. Here we will be explaining about carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Carbon monoxide that is CO is one of the most serious air pollutants. It is a colorless, odorless gas. It is highly poisonous to living beings because it has the ability to block the delivery of oxygen to the organs and tissues. It is produced as a result of incomplete combustion of carbon. Carbon monoxide is mainly released into the air by automobile exhausts. The other sources which produce CO 
involve incomplete combustion of coal, firewood, petrol, etc. The number of vehicles has been increasing over the years all over the world and many vehicles are poorly maintained and several have inadequate pollution control equipments resulting in the release of greater amount of carbon monoxide and other polluting gases. Do you know why carbon monoxide is poisonous? It binds to hemoglobin to form carboxyhemoglobin which is about 300 times more stable than oxygen hemoglobin complex. In blood, when the concentration of carboxyhemoglobin reaches about 3 to 4 percent, the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is greatly reduced. The oxygen deficiency results into the headache, weak eyesight, nervousness and cardiovascular disorder and that is the reason why people are advised not to smoke. In pregnant women who have the habit of smoking, the increased CO level in the blood may cause premature birth, spontaneous abortions and deformed babies. Coming to carbon dioxide, it is released into the atmosphere by respiration, burning of fossil fuels for energy and decomposition of limestone during the manufacture of cement. It is also emitted during volcanic eruptions. It is confined to troposphere only. Normally, it forms about 0.03 percent by volume of the atmosphere. With the increased use of fossil fuels, a large amount of carbon dioxide gets released into the atmosphere. The excess of carbon dioxide in the air is removed by green plants and this maintains an appropriate level of CO2 in the atmosphere. Green plants require carbon dioxide for photosynthesis and they in turn emit oxygen, thus maintaining this delicate balance. As you know, deforestation and burning of fossil fuels increases the carbon dioxide level and disturbs the balance in the atmosphere. This increased amount of CO2 in the air is mainly responsible for global warming and now we will be discussing global warming and greenhouse effect. About 75 percent of the solar energy reaching the earth is absorbed by the earth's surface which increases its temperature. The rest of the heat radiates back to the atmosphere. Some of the heat that is trapped by gases that is carbon dioxide, methane, ozone and CFCs which are chlorofluorocarbons and also by the water vapor in the atmosphere. Thus, these gases add to the heating of the atmosphere causing global warming. We all know that in cold places, flowers, vegetables and fruits are grown in glass covered areas called greenhouses. Do you know that we also are living in a greenhouse? Of course, you are not surrounded by the glass, but by a blanket of air called the atmosphere, which has kept the temperature on the earth constant for the centuries. But now it is undergoing a change though slowly. Just as the glass in the greenhouse holds the sun's warmth inside it, the atmosphere traps the sun's heat near the earth's surface and keeps it warm. This is called the natural greenhouse effect because it maintains a temperature and makes the earth perfect for life. In a greenhouse, the solar radiations pass through the transparent glass and heat up the soil and the plants. This warm soil and the plants emit infrared radiations. Since glass is opaque to infrared radiations that is thermal region, it partly reflects and partly absorbs these radiations. This mechanism keeps the energy of the sun trapped in the greenhouse. Similarly, CO2 molecules also trap heat as they are transparent to sunlight, but not to the heat radiation. 
if the amount of carbon dioxide crosses this delicate proportion of 0.03 percent, the natural greenhouse balance may get disturbed. CO2 is the major contributor to the global warming. Besides carbon dioxide, the other greenhouse gases are methane, water vapor, nitrous oxide, CFCs and ozone and methane is produced you know naturally by the vegetation which is burnt, digested or rotted in the absence of oxygen. Large amounts of methane are released in paddy fields, coal mines from rotting garbage dumps and by fossil fuels. The CFCs, these are man-made industrial chemicals used in air conditioning etc. These are also damaging the ozone layer about which we will be discussing in the forthcoming sessions. Nitrous oxide which occurs naturally in the environment is also a contributor to the global warming. In recent years, the quantities of these gases have increased significantly due to the use of chemical fertilizers and the burning of fossil fuels. If these trends continue, the average global temperature will rise to a level which will lead to melting of polar ice caps and flooding of low-lying areas all over the earth. The increase in the global temperature increases the incidence of infectious diseases like dengue, malaria, yellow fever, sleeping sickness, etc. So now you have a question that how to reduce the rate of global warming. If burning of fossil fuels, cutting down trees and forests will continue, then the release of greenhouse gases will continue in the atmosphere. So we should find out ways to use these very efficiently and very judiciously. One of the simple things which can do is to reduce global warming by minimizing the use of automobiles. Depending upon the situation, one can also use bicycle, public transport system or can go for carpools. We should plant more trees to increase the green cover, avoid burning of dry leaves and wood etc. It is also illegal to smoke in public places and workplaces because it is harmful not only for the ones who are smoking but also for others, so we should avoid it. Many people do not understand the greenhouse effect and global forming, so we can also help them by sharing this information with them. We will now explain about one more phenomena, very interesting one which is acid rain. You are aware that normally rainwater has a pH of 5.6 due to the presence of H plus ions formed by the reaction of rainwater with carbon dioxide present in the atmosphere. When the pH of rainwater drops below 5.6, it is called acid rain. Acid rain refers to the ways in which acid from the atmosphere is deposited on the earth's surface. The oxides of nitrogen and sulphur which are acidic in nature can be blown by the wind along with the solid particles in the atmosphere and finally they settle down either on the ground as dry deposition or in water, fog and snow as wet deposition. You can see this in the figure. The acid rain is a byproduct of a variety of human activities that emit oxides of sulphur and nitrogen in the atmosphere. As told earlier, the burning of fossil fuels which contain sulphur and nitrogenous matter that is coal and oil in power stations and furnaces or petrol and diesel in the motor engines produce sulphur dioxide and nitrogen oxides. These oxides after oxidation and reaction with water contribute to the acid rain because polluted air usually contains particulate matter that catalyzes this oxidation. You can see this in the reaction. Ammonium salts are also formed and can be seen as atmospheric haze that is aerosol of fine particles. Aerosol particles of oxides or ammonium salts in the raindrops result in wet deposition. SO2 is also absorbed directly by 
both solid and liquid ground surfaces and is thus deposited as dry deposition. The acid rain is harmful for agriculture, trees and plants as it dissolves and washes away nutrients which are needed for their growth. It also causes respiratory ailments in human beings and animals. When acid rain falls and flows as groundwater to reach rivers, lakes, etc., it affects plants and animal life in aquatic ecosystem. It also corrodes water pipes resulting in the leaching of heavy metals such as iron, lead and copper into the drinking water. Acid rain damages buildings and other structures made of stone or metal. The Taj Mahal in India has been affected by the acid rain, you know it. The air around the city of Agra where Taj Mahal is located contains high levels of oxides of sulphur and nitrogen. It is mainly due to the large number of industries and power plants around the area. The use of poor quality of coal, kerosene and firewood as a fuel for domestic purposes also adds to this problem. The resulting acid rain reacts with the marble that is calcium carbonate of the Taj Mahal. You can see this in the reaction and this is causing damage to the wonderful monument that has attracted people from around the world. This monument is now being slowly disfigured and the marble is getting discolored and lusterless. The government of India announced an action plan in 1995 to prevent the disfiguring of this historical monument. Let us now sum up what we have learnt in this session. The environmental pollution is the effect of undesirable changes in the surroundings that have harmful effects on the plants, animals and human beings. A substance which causes pollution is called a pollutant. Atmospheric pollution is generally studied as tropospheric and stratospheric pollution. The tropospheric pollution occurs due to the presence of undesirable solid or gaseous particles in the air. The gaseous air pollutants are oxides of sulphur, nitrogen and carbon, hydrogen sulphide, hydrocarbons, ozone and other oxidants. The particulate pollutants are dust, mist, fumes, smoke and smog etc. Some of the heat coming from solar radiation is trapped by the gases such as carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, CFCs and water vapor. These gases add to the heating of the atmosphere and lead to the global warming. When the pH of the rainwater drops below 5.6, it is called acid rain and acid rain has many harmful effects. Now it is time for you to answer some questions on the contents which you have just gone through. You can tell us why smoking is harmful, what gases are emitted by the vehicles in their exhaust fumes, what is global warming, how is acid rain occurring and what factors are contributing to both the global change which is the climate change and the acid rain. We hope that you have enjoyed viewing this session. Thank you very much for being with us. Mm -hmm.